Hello, Nelson. Hello, good evening. I'm so sorry I'm late. I was having trouble signing on. Oh, I'm glad I'm glad you're late because that means I'm not late. <laughs> or we're okay. dropping in. Hello. Hello, hello. How is everyone doing? Good. Oh, okay. How was Yom Hatzma'ut? Was there anything nice at the shul? I, I'm sorry, could you repeat that, please? Mm -hmm. Oh, I said, how is, how is Yom Hatzma'ut? Oh, Yom Hatzma'ut. We saw quite a uh, several interesting Zoom celebrations. Nice. So that was interesting. <laughs> Other than that, we were at home. How about you? We also, um, we got to see my kids' excitement, you know, as they came home from school, but that was that was about it this year. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, they they led the kids in the day school like on a parade around the block, like outside of school. That was very exciting. <laughs> there was one very, very uh, emotional moment, you might say. Uh, this was a uh, program put on by the um, March of the Living. Mm -hmm. You know that group? Sure. Uh, they go to Poland every year and yeah, then they, they, they go to Israel and they're there for Yom Hatzma'ut. Anyhow, there was um, a, a picture there at, toward, at the end of the show. It showed, I think there were about three Israeli uh, 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 fighter jets up in the sky, wheeling around over one of the concentration camps. Oh, wow. It was such a, I tell you, the symbolism was so powerful that it's just, uh, there they were wheeling in the sky above a Bergen, I think it was Bergen Belsen. Wow. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> powerful is in, in more ways than one, you're right. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Yes, I <laughs> I didn't go on March of the Living, but I went to Poland my year in Israel, and then we returned, obviously. And I think I think you do. You always go right after Pesach and come back at Yom Hatzmaut. Mm. It's an extraordinary experience. I'm grateful to have had it. Um, I found that one of the most amazing things when to Poland is if you have a chance to go straight to Israel from Poland. Yeah. That is like what 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 direction? <clears throat> why especially going from Poland to Israel? What is? No, you get you get to the bottom of the pit to the highest of the height. Uh, yeah, they yeah. usually take you right from the airport back to the hotel, right? There's like just a feeling of you dance down, you wear your blue and white. And, um... Yeah, we were in Auschwitz. We were in uh, <clears throat> it's the. The other one near Krakow. Well, they're all near Krakow. Mm -hmm. When what what was this? Um, who was uh, leading this group? Uh, well, this was uh, I was um, in the board of JCC in 1987. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Rabbi Yehiel Popko was the mm -hmm. Judaica director of the JCC. So uh -huh. an amazing teacher. It was a great guide to help. Yeah. <laughs> yes, he is. Uh, and we have an official guide uh, attached by the communist government of Poland, General Jaruzelski, that was with us in the bus the whole time, spewing the party lines and seeing the, conf the contrast, the clashing between he was Pope speaking, and him. It was, was amazing. Anyway. He was speaking English, uh, I'm imagining. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Polish English. I, yeah, it, it's a, a wild experience to go. Um, I, I, I remember as an 18 year old, I felt very fearful in Poland. I was just very anxious. I felt like, you know, people didn't like us when we got off the bus and it just made me nervous. I felt such relief going back to Israel. It really was a, a, a crazy emotional experience. 
Um, well, normally on Yom HaTzma'ud here, there's like a big community celebration at night, you know, lots of dancing and all the touching. That's not, <laughs> we would be shocked by these days. Um, but it was still nice. It was a nice light in the, the week. Um, wonderful. Well, it's nice to see everyone. I will admit that more than any of the parashiot about the Mishkan, this one really stumped me <laughs> first. There's not a whole lot redeeming about Tazria Mitzora, I think, <laughs> but I'm going to do the best I can. <laughs> um, <coughs> right, I certainly, I grew up making that um, art project that I'm sure many of your kids or you made um, with like the lips and the hands with the finger over the mouth. I don't know if and that was like a Boston specific, but it was the, there was like a hand with that you made have leprosy on it. And there were like lips with a shh to say like no lush and hara that was like the project you brought home from school um and so that has always sort of been my basic understanding of tsarat um but i think that um there is more we can find some some you know nice meaning beyond the dermatology of it all um so i want to look at the two types of tsarat there's the body tsarat um, that comes first, and then the house tzara'at that comes later in um, the first parsha of Tazria. And to think about two cases of tzara'at um, that come up in, um, in Tanakh, so the first of Miriam, and then the second is from the Haftorah that we read very, very rarely because it's the Haftorah of, um, of Tazria, and so you only read it um, on years where they're separated. And then there's like a good likelihood that the Tazria Parsha will be Parsha HaChodesh and you'll read a different Haftorah. So it's very unusual, but um, it is from Malachim Bet and it talks about the um, Naaman, the Sar of, um, of a foreign nation. And so, and he's afflicted with Tzarat. So hopefully we can think a little bit, <laughs> figure out uh, what's going on with Tzarat. What is the, the purpose of Tzarat? Um, so let me share the screen here. Make sure I do it right. Let's see, there we go. Um, so I thought we would afflict ourselves with some uh, Sarat uh, passages, um, both of the body Sarat and then of the house Sarat, and sort of try to think about um, differences and similarities between them. Um, Right, so the first um, the first part of Tzarat is about uh, a woman who's just given birth. But when we move into in uh, sorry of Tzaria, when we move into Tzarat, um, we start to think about um, when it happens on your body, right? So Adam Kiyeb or Basaro, when it's on his skin of his body, um, that and there's some kind of thing, right? Aseit or Safachat or Baharet, a rash or a discoloration or a swelling, Bahayab or Basaro Lenega Tzarat. And so it becomes what is translated as a scaly, a scaly affection on the skin of your body, what do you do? You don't go to the doctor, you you go to the Kohen, or right? And so he sort of has a checklist of what it looks like and um, what it feels like, or maybe where it is on your body, and he can say whether it is sarat or not. And he says that he pronounces him unclean. Right, and so um, this is from the beginning of Parakya Gimel that um, the, the person is isolated. Um, and then we see sort of towards the end in Pasuk um, uh, Mem Vav, kol uh, yeme asher hanega bo itamata mehu, badad yeshev michutz l'machane moshavo. Right, that the person who is unclean, as long as the disease is upon him, um, he sits apart outside of the camp right? Quarantined almost, if you will. Uh, although really different because quarantining usually happens in your house today. And this is right, you're taken outside. Um, and since we know um, from, and we're going to jump back and forth here, from Devarim Rabbah that, um, 
right? Who is the prime example of bodily tzarat is Miriam. Um, and here we see why, um, sorry, here we go, um, right? Uh, that Amar Rabbi Hanina, Ein Hanegeim Ba'im Ela Alashon Hara. Right, so we know that um, the text tells us that Miriam and Aaron were talking about Moshe, and that then Miriam gets in trouble and she gets Sarat. And so Rabbi Chanina says, well, "We know that um, right that you get Sarat because you've said Lashon Hara." Right, and so I think that there's something here about understanding um, that bodily tzara'at comes from Lashon Hara, um, why you have to leave the camp. And I think that it is, um, and the theme that we'll see running through is about boundaries. And so what I would like to propose, right, is that when you tell Lashon Hara, you start to remove some people's boundaries in ways that are, is not invited for you to do, right? So <clears throat> when I gossip with someone about uh, a friend's, you know, marriage and potential divorce, she has put up a healthy boundary with the world and I have taken it down by sort of inviting people into her personal business. And so what's the antidote for such behavior is you have to go outside and you have to think about what your boundaries are. You have to maybe um, thicken your boundaries in some way, um, right? to search for maybe better habits for oneself, right? Because if this is about your poor behavior and the way that you sort of don't respect boundaries, here you're being told, well, there's a really clear boundary and you are on the other side until you can sort of figure, figure out your behavior. How does that, how does that sit? Is that... Okay. Well, let's see it in contrast to that. Reminds me a little bit of, um... Bilam, like when he looked out and what was supposed to be so great when he saw the camp that all the tents weren't facing each other and that people had their privacy and their boundaries from each other. Mm -hmm. Right, because some boundaries are healthy. It's, you know, it's a good thing. We're working on it with my children about like being naked outside, right? Like there are times and places to share and there are times where it's, it's, it's healthy to have boundaries um, and limits, yeah. You know, you want some privacy from your neighbors and you want to be able to, to have healthy boundaries. Um, but I do think that that um, leads into the idea of how to at because it's all, it's really a balance at the end of the day. Um, <coughs> right, so in this case, perhaps the person has um, boundaries that are too, too strong, as we'll see. So in the next parak, when it talk, talks about house Sarat, fascinatingly, it talks about somehow this is about Israel, right? Kitavo el Arts Kanan, Asherani no Temachem Achuza, Benatati Nega Tarat Bevet Arts Eret Achuzat Chem. Right? That the um, God is saying that God will invite or give the plague of Tarat to your home. Uva Asher Lo Habait, he give la Kohen le more. Um, kenega near uh, uh, kenega near ali babait, right? So just like with that, with your own bodily affliction, you go to the kohen, the the tzarat doctor. You say, "Uh oh, I see tzarat in my house." Vitzivah kohen ufinu et habait, but teram yavo ha kohen lirot et tanega. And so here, interestingly, the priest shall order the house cleared before the priest enters to examine the plague. Velo yitzma kol asher babait, v'achar kenya yavo ha kohen lirot et habait. Right, that nothing in the house might become unclean. And after that, the priest shall enter to examine the house. And so here, um, the Devarim Rabbi explores why you get house tzarat. It's not from Lashon Hara, right? Your walls can't actually speak. Um, and so they wonder, what does this come from? It comes from Ayyadei Ayin Hara, which really is an evil eye, but is really more of like a stinginess in, in the language of this uh, Midrash. And Rabbi Yitzchak explains, Benohag Adam Omer Right, as we know, a neighbor comes to your door and says, hey, can you lend me your axe to chop this wood? Um, and you have an axe in your house, but Behu Omerli, Ainli, but you don't want to lend out your nice axe or, you know, maybe this person is, um, 
maybe this person is actually, um, you know, notoriously bad at returning things or often breaks things and forgets to re repair them. And so you just say, oh, I don't, I don't actually have an ex, sorry. Um, right, Kachomer, again, um, you know, can I have a hakfa rashalach, right, your, um, your sieve. And again, through like the spirit of stinginess, uh, Omer, ainli me'ayin hara. Um, okay, so this is why why the, the mold, the tzara'at, comes to your house is because you were stingy in some way. Um, and so what happens? Mia uh, bahanega, right? The, the tzara'at comes al to tzchila, mifnim, kol ma shahaya lo betoch beto. Kevan shahaya motzi, kol ma shahaya lo betoch beto. Right, when, they, when the Kohen says, you get out of your house and you have to empty your house of all your things, Kardu motav v'kivarotav, right? Those things, the things he said he didn't have, the axe and the sieve, conveniently, right? Hayu ro'im omrim re'itam ayin harasha haya biyado masha haya lo lo haya rotzela hashiel, right? People can sit there on like we have a our neighbor has a wall, right? They can sit on the wall. And, oh yeah, I really did have an axe. She did have a sieve. She just didn't want to share. Um, and that somehow in this case, it's almost as though the opposite has happened, right? We have created a, <coughs> we have created a, um, a, a boundary that is too strong, um, so strong that we're not willing to let people in through that boundary. And so the antidote here is not to be exiled out of the community, but to be exiled into it, right? You can't sit in your tower and pretend that nothing affects you or the world. You have to go out and live in the community. Now you have to be the one to say, hey, could I come sleep in your spare bedroom because my house is being detzerated, right? Um, and you have to ask someone else for help and see how it feels maybe to be on the other end of that, um, that spectrum. And so I thought it was really interesting um, right, that the, the way that we play with healthy boundaries, because sometimes boundaries are really good, and sometimes we make them too strong. Um, I certainly feel that very powerfully at this moment with COVID, right, that we, at least in our pod, we are very, very strict. And so we've spent a long time building very, very thick boundaries between us and the world. And figuring out how to lower those boundaries appropriately is hard, and that similarly, people who didn't have good boundaries during COVID, right, who didn't wear masks and didn't, you know, I think they're trying to adjust to a world where it might be more the norm. They can't really get away with not wearing a mask uh, in public. Um, and so it felt, it felt like this was a good thing to sort of call our attention to at this time. <laughs> um, and before we look at the Malachim, uh, the, yeah, the Malachim Bet um, example, um, I think that, um, just making sure, yeah, Malachim Beth, that's right. Um, I just thought there was this fascinating piece here at the beginning of this Devarim Rabbah um, that I wanted to call our attention to. Um, they, the, the rabbis learned that Adam sheyesh bo nega v'hayaha kohen krovo mahu sheyehe mutar lo lirotav. Um, right, they say a person who has a blemish and the priest was his relative, can the priest come and look at the, the blemish? Um, <coughs> and the answer is yes. So, um, right, that's, that's what the Chachamim teach. And so we would allow like a Kohen who's a relative to be the, the one to... Um, to diagnose him, but Rabbi Meir says, Omer af lo no, even not the blemishes of his relative. And I, I couldn't help but feel like, right, it's kind of like when everyone else knows that you're being stubborn about something or crazy, right? And like, and you just can't see it. We don't, we can't, it's really hard to recognize our own blemishes, right? In English, I think it works better. It's, you're, you know, luckily no one has a uh, Sarat <laughs> in our world but that um, sometimes we need the outside perspective of our Kohen, whether that's like a friend or a family member, or a mentor, or a rabbi, um, to say like, hey, you, you have it now. <laughs> um, it's not just, you can't hide behind like, oh, it's just a rash, it's just eczema. Like you have Sarat now. Um, and that there's that perspective piece that's so important. <coughs> um, 
So um, unless anyone has thoughts, uh, I wanted to look at this story because it's just, it's just so interesting. I think um, I love um, the crazy stories of those Nevi'im, right? Like all of those people behaving so oddly and poorly throughout a Malachim and Aleph and Bet. Um, it's like almost like a soap opera that sometimes unfolds on your, uh, your page. Um, and so this story, and I, I cut and paste a bit, is about <coughs> uh, Naaman. He's the commander of the army, the Sar Tzava, Melech Aram. And it's, the text goes out of its way to say, he was Hayat Ish Gadol Lifne Adonav Venusa Panim. Um, right, that he was important to his Lord and high in his favor because he had given, he had gotten this victory, but he had leprosy, right? He had Sarat. And the, the piece I cut out just for, you know, time and uh, interest level um, is about, um, he ha happened to have a young maid in his um, house who said like, hey, I think you have Sarat and that you need to get this taken care of. <laughs> and she says, you know, there are people who can take care of it from my country, from my home, and um, that there's a prophet that can cure it. And so um, Naaman sends word to Elisha, the, the Navi, um, and Elisha tells him the cure, right? The cure is to go bathe. Right? It's pretty easy. Go to the Yardin, to the Jordan River, dip seven times and you'll be restored. But this it infuriates Naaman. Um, he's outraged because he came all the way to Israel, right? And he thought that he was gonna be cured by a holy man. And instead, for those of us who have been to Israel, we know the Yardane is not like a super impressive river, right? Um, he's coming from uh, the rivers in Damascus that he thinks are superior to the Yardane, which is probably like a little bit of a muddy puddle at some points. Um, and that he doesn't want to go down into the river. He wanted the Navi to come out and kowtow to him and like wave his arms around and, and cure him magically. Um, <coughs> and so he leaves, but the servants talk him back into going back to the, the place and, and, and he says, okay, I'll go do it. And here, I think we see a clue for why um, Naaman did not want to do this because what does he have to do? He has to go down. There's something about um, lowering the boundaries um, of his, um, you know, haughty, uh, uh, what is he, commander hood, right? To say that he's sort of just like everyone else uh, in the world. Um, he's no better than anyone else. His cure is the same as anyone else's. So even though he has um, bodily tzarat, so it's not a perfect example, it'd be better if it was his house, right? We see sort of the way that um, Miriam has lowered too many boundaries and has to leave the camp to build back maybe some appropriate ones. And Naaman has too many boundaries. He won't even do this little easy thing to cure himself. And so he has to be willing to lower those boundaries in order to be cured. And I think it's interesting that both like, both with Naaman and also just in general with the house, um, if you think about it, both like the exiling, the push out of the community, and then the pull back into it when you have to leave your house and all your stuff and stay on someone's couch. Um, both are paths that seem to be an opening to reflection or evaluation of values and to find some way back into a connection with God and mitzvot and our community um, because they feel sort of opposite um, in, their, in their tensions. Um, and so I think that Sara'at, um, to say that it is a punishment for Lashon Hara is almost like just too simplified. Um, and that really, it seems to me, I, I think it's a compelling argument to say that Sara'at is about having unhealthy boundaries. And it's a, it's a physical manifestation of that. And so you have to sort of figure out, are my boundaries too low? Have I been inviting people where they don't belong in my life or others? Or are they too high? And I need to find a way to be more open and available in my, in my community. Uh, it does not make the text any more appealing, but <laughs> maybe makes the message a little nicer. <laughs> I'll give you a Russian Hara interpretation <laughs> of this last passage, okay. right? Aram is an enemy of Israel, right? Mm -hmm. It's a good Yom Asma'ud for it, maybe. 
what's his complaint? He says, the waters down in Israel stink. Where mm -hmm. I come from, that's where the good waters are. <coughs> he's speaking Lush and Hara against the land of Israel mm -hmm. and is curious to go down to the land of Israel and dip in its waters. Hmm. That's very nice. I like that. I think that and, it is. Yeah, go ahead. No, just before we started, I said, let's see if El can make this interesting. <laughs> and you did a good job. <laughs> It really was a struggle, I've got to tell you. It was, uh, it's not an easy, an easy Parsha to read. Um, it's so removed. I, this, I feel like this is such an unprofessional question, but I have to ask, has anyone here read the novel Mexican Gothic? No. 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 I don't want to ruin it. But if any of you choose to read it, it's a, it's a light, easy read. Um, I would love to talk about how it intersects with this Parsha. I'll give you a, a teaser. <laughs> But I would ruin it entirely if I said anything more than that. So it's called Mexican Gothic. It's like, a, it's a short, nice novel. I highly recommend it. <laughs> I found one person so far in all of my asking over this week. I had this like sort of like, you know, that eerie feeling where like things intersect in a way you don't think they should. And that, and that was it. Um, I ha It happened to come off my wait list last week. Sylvia Moreno Garcia. Yes. Sure, I'll borrow, I'll read it. Excellent, all right, we'll have to follow up next week. Are you um, making an assignment? Yes, exactly, a modern uh, literature assignment. And I'm sad that Sai is not here, our friend, because I was, as a stroke of luck, we read the Ramban that we learned together last week in class the next day on Friday. So A, I got to feel like a hot shot for knowing things that other people didn't know because I had prepared it. Um, but someone had, now I should have written it down. I think it's in my study. Someone had this great thought about our own. You know, it's good he's not here because now I can't, I can't think of it. I'm going to have to ask her tomorrow. Maybe he'll be here next week. But it was a good insight in our own. I meant to follow up. I'm not in my normal spot, so I, I don't have it with me. Um, yes, I think Tarat is, is a struggle. And I think that that's why, you know, I think that's why we tie it into so many sort of crazy Midrashim, right? There's nothing to indicate that the reason your house gets Tarat is because you hid your, your items from other people or some of the more even provocative Rashi, you know, sort of explains it's like a treasure hunt that, um, we know that uh, the Canaanites left gold hidden in the walls of their homes. And so God causes this affliction so that you will take your house apart and find the gold. Like they're all, you know, I think it just shows the sort of discomfort with such an odd thing that doesn't happen anymore. But may you all have uh, blemish-free weekends filled with healthy boundaries. And hopefully next week uh, we can return to something slightly more interesting. This was very interesting. It was, yeah, and you made it even more interesting. I'm glad. I'm so glad to hear it. Thank you, Yael. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Have a good Shabbos. Have a good Shabbos. Nice I saw the hand of Barry, so maybe <laughs> there is a Barry. That's right. That's how I know he was here, because at, at the end, I see the hands. <laughs> if I ever am so lucky to come to your community, I'm going to have to ask everyone to show me their hands so I can find Barry. <laughs> I won't know his face. Have a wonderful Shabbat. I'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. What time is it? Eight, uh, almost 8.30, 8.29. Yeah. Oh, she's just wonderful. She took my Tarat and made something out of it. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Tazia, what's the club